everybody. Welcome to this month's Obscure Animation. This is the series that we do where we talk about uh, more obscure or independent or underpriced or however we want to describe it that month. <laughs> uh, we have a fun time talking about animation is the main idea. And today we are talking about some Tex Avery films that we saw at the uh, TCM Classic Film Festival. And I am from Rachel Wagner, and Stanford is here. Hey, how's it going? Yay! <laughs> Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, thank you. Yes. Excited to talk with you about some classic animation. I'm so excited. And yeah, I mean, this is classic, so you could say it's not obscure. But I think, like, the average human being doesn't know Tex Avery. I and, agree. You know? Yeah. So this is our chance to talk about him and his work. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And... We just had the TCM Classic Film Festival, which oh, I know stars. my you, favorite, as you know. Yeah, so you've you've gone in person in the past, correct? I have, yeah, and it's it's incredible. You know, they usually do it in um, Hollywood, mm-hmm. and uh, it's just four days of, of of trying to see as many movies as you can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they have like four venues, and you know, so you have to pick, mm-hmm. and all the movies are playing concurrently. But uh, it's it's such a treat. And because of COVID, you know, they, these last two years now, they did it last year. And then again, if that last year's festival, it was already planned and I had booked my tickets and everything. And they just, they, they canceled it just weeks before, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and this year they just did it all virtually again. Um, but it was, that was so much fun, you know? Yeah. Saw, last yeah. year I participated this year. I did. I had high goals. I wanted to, but I, every day the things just kept coming and coming and coming. And so I didn't end up getting to participate as much as hardly at all. Really only this Tex Avery thing was really the only thing that I, I, uh, and watching, I remember mama, those were the only two things that I, I really got to do, but. Hey, but good choices. mm -hmm. Those are good things you got to watch. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think that I remember mama. It's, I was so happy to see that it was getting, uh, getting such a, a featured spot because I don't think it gets the love as a family classic that it deserves. Yeah, such a good film. Mm-hmm. I love I was... the book, and uh, it's called "From uh, Mama's Bank Account." Is the book right? And, yeah, uh, you were I, telling me about that. Yeah. yeah, and I love the movie. I think it's it's just so sweet and charming. Yeah, I that was so good, and I, I watched just a bunch of movies all week. I just you just mm-hmm. kind of. Plan as you know, as if I were in California. You know, that's mm-hmm. just it was my mindset. Um, and uh, even though I never left my living room, I still just you know loved it. The uh, yeah. Uh, and what's so fun about that festival is that you know if you I mean you can watch a lot of classic films that you're probably you know already familiar with, right? Which is which is a huge part of what I enjoy doing there. But mm-hmm. I also always try to do watch you know attend new something stuff. or watch something that's new to me and. This was so informational for me because, you know, I I knew of Tex Avery. Yeah. You know, but I didn't know that much about him. And so the the this this programming block they did on him was was terrific. I mean, I just mm-hmm. you know, it was one of the highlights just because I learned so much, you know. Mm-hmm. And I just really enjoyed mm-hmm. enjoyed watching it too. Do um, they often have animation featured in the festival? Typically they try to have some animation. Yeah. In some way, you know, and, and kudos to them. You know, they really try to represent a lot of different film genres. So, you know, try to do some silent film, mm-hmm. uh, you know, classic film from different eras, different styles, different, you know, um, some foreign film and different things too. And then, yeah. And then animation often they, uh, they program a, a Disney feature. And so that, of course I'm always all over that. Uh, Cause the, Another hi- highlight of the festival too is that they every film gets introduced, and it's either by one of the TCM hosts or they bring in a guest, um, or both. You know, I mean, you know, they'll have yeah. kind of all, all of the above. Like they'll have like Leonard Malton there. Something yes, like that. exactly. Leonard or, or Floyd Norman or somebody oh. you know who, who's worked on the films or who's who's got connection with you know the various studios or whatnot. Floyd Norman was scheduled to introduce a film uh i think it was the sword and the stone at last year's you know and again it got it got 
canceled. So oh, that whole, would be so cool. That would have been really. That would have been really cool. But um, people don't know Floyd Norman is an incredible animator uh, at uh, Disney for many many years. Yeah, and he's one of the few living who's who you know worked with Walt and he worked with all the Nine Old Men and mm-hmm. you know he was he worked on Sleeping Beauty. I think that's when I think that's when he got hired was to actually work on Sleeping Beauty. I mean, so stuff like that. That's Incredible. what's so fun about the TCM Festival. So this, you know, watching that, this Tex Avery documentary, uh, in a way, I thought felt, even though it was, you know, made, what, in like 1980, if I'm not mistaken, or 1988, um, it still kind of felt very festival-ish, you know, TCM Classic Film Festival, like, because it's, you know, you're just hearing people, give accounts of, 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 of working, you know, with these, with these incredible filmmakers. Yeah, it really did. It, it almost felt like a classic, just the documentary. Yes. About the, the way that, the way that they were talking, the way the interview we done, it's just different. Like if you compare it to like Howard or a recent uh, documentaries kind of in that style, it's just, we have a different style now than we did then. Yeah. Documentaries. Yes. Agreed. And and uh, so I was so happy to so to watch this. So it was about an hour long, wasn't it? This the mm-hmm. text, and then and then they showed like I think like fifty minutes of of Tex Avery cartoons that he made during his time at MGM. Well, and TCM was kind enough not only to give me a they have like they had like a screener block of programming that they sent me, uh, and so I was able to watch the. Uh, the shorts but also i emailed them because i had missed the documentary uh, i missed it on my dvr so i emailed them and i said we're doing this podcast i if you could help me out so i could watch this documentary so they were kind enough to send me a link so thank you very much that was very nice oh, outstanding great <laughs> so, that's so great i appreciate it uh but yeah let's talk about uh tex avery a little bit so uh, we learn in this uh, in this documentary that he started out uh, working at uh, working on Oswald the Rabbit. Yeah, wasn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. But yeah, he, and it was after you know Universal Studios had done their hostile takeover <laughs> of uh, Oswald the Rabbit because it was while well, you know he worked at Universal. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, anyway, yeah, I thought that was that was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he started out as an inker, I guess, on yeah. the Oswald, the like a rabbit series, and uh, then I mean, it's amazing when you learn about the 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 attention to detail that those line in uh, ink uh, painter has had to go through. It's incredible. Oh, I agree. Mm-hmm. And so he started on the short films, and then. He immediately wanted to push for more adult content uh, into his films when he worked. He said he uh, that he his humor was based on adult concerns, irrational fear, concerns over status, survival, paranoia, sex, or if not sex, a brave stab at it. <laughs> <That's what he laughs> <said. laughs> yeah. Which I thought was really interesting because you don't think of when you think of particularly Bugs Bunny, you and that's who I think of initially when I think of Tex Avery. I don't necessarily think of that adult humor. So watching these, it was kind of like, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting to me too. Enlightening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there anything new that you learned that stuck out to you about in this documentary? Well, oh, a lot, you know, I mean, and I, that's probably where I had learned about Tex Avery and the, you know, in his creation of Bugs Bunny, but it was just so interesting to get that timeline, you know, to just to mm-hmm. appreciate more of, you know, his, his, uh, not so much his rise, but just, but just his, the arc of his career, you know, um, mm-hmm. that he, that he had first started with Walter Lance, you know, uh, productions doing Oswald stuff, and then, and then how how just how critical he was to uh, uh, the Warner Brothers mm-hmm. uh, cartoons, both in both the aesthetic of it and and the humor 
<laughs> you know, just as you were describing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he seemed like one of those artists that hated his own success, you know, yeah. that yeah. was sort yeah. of a, a narcissistic in that way. I mean, because mm-hmm. he started doing commercials because he was, he was so burnt out, I guess, of doing. Yeah, he the, got so burnt out in the, in the kind of mid 50s, I think, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Where, yeah, yeah. he, he turned to doing, doing commercials. And I'm not sure, did he ever really, I mean, did they talk about it, dude? Did he ever really go back to, to, uh, animation in a, in, in, in a big way or was he just kind of done after, uh, um, you know, I think that he, let's see, what did they say? Yeah. Commercials. Uh, yeah. It says here, his final employer, Hannah Barbera productions, where he wrote uh, gags for Saturday morning cartoons, such as droopy esque quickie koala. Yeah. So I guess he did a little bit, but not a much. little bit with, yeah. Hannah Barbera. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it says, during the 1960s and 70s, Avery became increasingly de- reserved and depressed due to, to the suicide of his son, oh, it's sad, and the breakup of his marriage, although he continued to draw respect from his peers. So, uh, but I, I thought one of the most interesting, as an animation fan, re- re- revelations, I guess, in the documentary was why he said, what's up, Doc? yeah. I agree. Yeah, mm-hmm. please. Yeah. T- t- he said that everybody in his high school, they would call each other Doc. That was like the slang at the time. And what? And so he, he put in, what's up, Doc? <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. That it, well, yeah, that it just came from his life experience where instead of just some kind of thing, the right, you know, they, they came up in the writer's room or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting. It said he said at one point that said he set out to alienate his audience with a constant reminder that you were watching a film. And I I was curious what you thought about this because we were just talking about how we both didn't like Tenet, which alienated its audience f- from the film, you know, with its sound mix and its mess and uh, convoluted. And yeah. so, but this is more of an intriguing way that he would do it. Uh, and I think maybe it partly worked because it's shorts, yeah. you know, like you can only, and then maybe this is why the Looney Tunes haven't really worked in feature films. We'll see if they can break out of that with this new space jam. Coming yeah. Out. With but, the space jam. Yeah. But there is something about that kind of violence that I think is hard to sell in a feature film. We've just seen it with Tom and Jerry that most people hated. Uh, and I don't know. What do you think about that? You know, I think that's a really, um, you bring up a really interesting point. The, uh, and, you know, and they show some examples of that in, you know, in that documentary. But uh, uh, clearly, you know, if you compare it to like a, like a Mickey Mouse short, for example, of the same time period, it's really different. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, no duh. But uh, the, the tone of it is so different because so often the characters are like breaking um, the fourth wall. Right. You know, they're like talking at the screen or there's even one <laughs> where they draw it. And like, you know, there's a wolf that's chasing somebody. I, you know, I don't know if he's chasing a cat. I mean, I can't remember. There's mm-hmm. always so much chasing and, and kind of violence. And it almost, you know, like a precursor to mm-hmm. why the coyote and, and Roadrunner, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but and how he's he's running. So f- this character is running so fast that they the way that they draw it, he like actually draw it runs off of the film strip. <laughs> you know, we see that. And then he comes back on and then they recenter the film. It's very I thought it was funny, very clever. Yeah. But um, you know, I guess because I just also grew up on these cartoons, you know, because mm-hmm. I always loved watching like the Looney Tunes. There used to be Looney Tunes for blocks of, yeah. of programming like on Saturday mornings. Uh and I even think there was like a Tex Avery show or something they'd call, you know, and they'd show some of these Tex Avery yeah. specific cartoons. But uh Anyway, uh, it's always something that I've that I liked. I think yeah. maybe just because I grew up on it. Oh, I adore the Looney Tunes, and I think that uh, I just think it's interesting that that I think there's something to the fact that he was trying to challenge his audience. Yes, and not just kind of 
it's just a cartoon kind of a thing, right? You know, you know exactly. And Rachel, you bring up this reminds me too of the, how they were talking about you know, they were talking to Chuck Jones, you know, who was mm-hmm. really learned, right? He was on the Tex Avery team there at, uh, at Warner Brothers, if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm not sure if Chuck Avery, if did he work on any of those MGM shorts, mm-hmm. but um, anyway, uh, they were talking about how you know how they worked in that in that bungalow on the Warner brothers lot, which they, which they nicknamed oh, termite. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was termite terrace. Is that right. the name? Yeah. Yeah. And it was just this kind of, del- and truly there were, I mean, there were a lot of termites, I guess, in this building and it was just not that great of a spot. And it allowed them just to work like, like studio executives didn't really come in and bug them. Right. You know, they just created this stuff. And I wonder if that, because of that freedom that led to some of the, you know, these, these exact type of things we're talking about, you know, uh, that they could almost get away with stuff that if, if they were under the supervision of some kind of, you know, micromanager mm. or micro producer or whatever you want to call them, yeah. that, uh, they wouldn't be able, they wouldn't get away with the kind of humor that they were doing. Yeah. There's a freedom kind of, I think in it that yeah, is exciting. Is. And I, like I said, I think it works because it is shorts and that mm-hmm. if it if it had if it had been a feature, I don't know if it would have worked as well. And and he says somewhere in there, he says we knew Disney had the kid audience sewn up, yeah. So yeah. we went for teens and adults, yeah. So that's I thought that's interesting. And he says you can destroy a character, kill him, maim him, and just bring him back to life again. So the audience sees it as funny. Mm-hmm. And I think because maybe that little sense of shock that maybe you first feel. And then that release of sort of laughing about it. Yes. You know, that, that, that that's the key. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, In fact, there's, you know, there's one of those um, shorts. Uh, the title loses me. I'll, I'll have to look at the list. But mm-hmm. it's, you know, I mean, I think we're used to seeing, like, particularly, you know, with Looting Tunes, you know, anvils falling on characters or just yeah. heavy things falling on characters. And there's one where just progressively – heavier things keep falling on the character. In fact, at one point, a full airplane. <laughs> falls on the sky. And, yeah. You know, and I was just laughing so hard during all that. It was just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's so violent, but it's so funny. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. And it that works. One, it works. What? That was bad luck. Blackie. Bad luck. Blackie. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. was really funny. It was funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, uh, he says it's so wild and insane it couldn't it couldn't possibly happen and that makes it funny. He never saw it as violent. He was not a violent person. Yeah. And of course then they have June Foray on here who's the best. How cool was that? Yeah. That was neat. <laughs> Uh, so I, I enjoyed watching the documentary. It it was nostalgic enjoyable they had doug clampett and chuck jones interviewed quite a bit on it yes and uh the uh uh his very first oscar nomination was a short he did where a wolf is in place of hitler and yeah. uh, that was <laughs> showed how you know bold he was going to be from the beginning mm-hmm a legend, Tex Avery, obviously, in his creation of so many incredible characters, him and Chuck Jones. Well, uh, yeah, and, you know, that was interesting to me, too, because, you know, they're talking about how he, at Warner Brothers, you know, he was involved with, of course, Bugs Bunny, but um, uh, Porky Pig yeah. and and uh, Daffy Duck. Uh, so, mm-hmm. anyway, I thought, I thought that yeah. was, I thought that was cool. I... I had hadn't seen any of these shorts that were in the uh, collection that they, then they showed. Had you seen yeah. any of them before? Um, no, I don't think I, I'm, you know, I might've seen that red riding hood one mm-hmm. somewhere, but the other ones and, and, well, and maybe that droopy cartoon, but, but then, you know, those droopy cartoons all in a way kind of run together with me. Cause they're all, I mean, the humor is all very similar. Even yeah. though they changed the setting. I so. had seen Droopy in other things before. Uh huh. I think he's in Roger Rabbit. Yeah, Droopy's yeah. in Roger Rabbit. I mm-hmm. think he's like runs the elevator or something. And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so I'd seen him, but I had, I don't know if I had ever, or had been a long time since I'd watched a full short. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but it, I was, I tweeted out as like, he's hilarious. Yeah. So funny. The sh- I love the shorts they picked. So they, they yeah. picked seven or they, were there seven, Rachel? Let's or, see here. One, or two, there's six. three, four, five, six, seven. Seven shorts that Tex Avery directed while he was at MGM, mm-hmm. which was from like 19... 19- 43 to 19 like 55 i don't think they showed anything mm-hmm. yeah i think they did show something from 1955 so they, there was kind of a, a variety of, of of things but they were i thought they were i i was so entertained by all of mm-hmm. them yeah it was really neat and i loved the animation throughout and there was definitely an edge to them that was surprising and fun yeah well let's dive in and talk about them so the first one, this is in Tex Avery cartoon collection, was Red Hot Riding Hood. Yeah, which is the one I had mentioned. I think that's the one I, I had already seen at some point. <clears throat> yeah, and so it starts out with the traditional story of Red Riding Hood. <laughs> and uh, he says, oh, stop it. I'm fed up with that sissy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> huh. And so it all it gets changed from the forest, and all of a sudden it's in the city. And grandma's house, granny's house is grandma's joint. <laughs> this is <laughs> jazz a lounge. club. Yeah, cloud, club. <laughs> the Sunset Strip and Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf was right on her trail. And <laughs> so, yeah, Red Riding Hood just becomes this saucy, you know, I mean, yeah. speaking of just like Jessica Rabbit. Right. You know what exactly. I mean? <laughs> That's what I thought of when I saw her. That of- yeah. Like and Betty then the Boop wolf meets just some, yeah, Betty Boop meets Jessica Rabbit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> little red riding, uh, uh, little hot riding hood. A little hot, <laughs> yeah, red hot riding hood. Yeah, and and the wolf becomes kind of like this heckler in the audience in a way, you know. But he's doing one of those things where you know, and I think you know, it's cl- classic tech Tex Avery. The eyes pop, you know, pop out, yeah. and and he's super aggressive, which course we know isn't you know not that great but uh but uh still i think with it's 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 a representation of his work you know, right but i actually his... wouldn't necessarily I mean, he is aggressive but she always has the upper hand the whole movie. oh no question yeah exactly yeah. she she she's not yeah there's no messing with her yeah <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's not as problematic as uh as to use a modern word as you might think uh the you know i'm not a big fan of sort of the googly eyes sometimes but i guess for this i like it better than say at the end of jungle book which i hate uh that scene and i guess because especially because i feel like at the end of jungle book it undermines this emotional moment we've just had where he's you know uniting with with uh, with um blue yeah. Uh, you know he thought was dead and everything and then all of a sudden he sees the girl and up oh, he's he's uh hypnotized and his eyes go googly um yeah and so I, I really don't like that but this it's over the top anyway the whole right. thing so i think it's a little bit different than in the middle of bambi for you know for <laughs> For Bambi right. to be fun and be like, oh, I just, I don't like it. Yeah. But for this kind of comedy, I think it's more, more acceptable. And I thought it was helpful to learn more in the documentary, you know, which yeah. they had just, which they showed just prior to the showing the shorts, the uh, uh, kind of the genesis of that, you know, style of humor in the, mm-hmm. in his cartoons. Uh, yeah and she starts singing this song this daddy song which i guess yeah. was a hit song which seems very racy for 1941 oh absolutely daddy you better get the best yeah. of me <laughs> yeah but i guess we forget that things like may west and stuff was yeah in that era which was very saucy yeah exactly that sort of reminded me of too was, uh, you know yeah kind of this yeah saucy pre-code <laughs> Uh, and then the grandma is very aggressive it, to this wolf. <laughs> Alas, a wolf. What's your hurry? What's your hurry, Harry? 
I also thought that the probably the funniest gag in the whole bit was her having that door that was just to the outside. Oh, I love that. He opens the door and he's like, ah! <laughs> that was funny. You know, it's funny. And again, to go back to the documentary, it was so fun to listen to these people talk about the creation of these gags. And I just imagine, and it seemed like they legitimately were having fun creating these films. I mean, I know it was a ton of work, but that, that Tex Avery would come up with these gags and I think he just had everybody rolling, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, how fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the, and you figure you, it must be really hard to make funny animation because you just spend so much time on each individual gag that it, you must start to wonder, is this funny anymore? Like what's yeah. happened? Especially yeah. back then. Uh, I mean, I know they storyboarded out and stuff, but still. Yeah. yeah. So there's red riding, red hot riding hood. Yes. Red hot riding. Hood. The <laughs> final gag with him literally coming out of his skin. It was pretty funny. With the oh wolf. Yeah. I thought it was funny too. Mm-hmm. Okay, then we have Bad Luck Blackie, and <laughs> which is the one we were talking yeah. about earlier. So this is a black cat and a, a white little kitten. Well, it's this white little kitten who's getting terrorized. I mean, he's getting bullied basically, right? By right, uh, yeah. He's getting bullied by this big bulldog. Type yeah, dog. and he comes. And this black cat who's confident and uh, gives the kitten his card and says, I'll defend you. And basically the whole rest of the, uh, of the film is all about this, uh, this dog and this cat battling it out kind of a thing. Yeah. And I liked especially the gag where, <laughs> where they uh they he just moves the x instead of <laughs> things and the the safe falls on wherever the x is <laughs> and gets the that was, funny. that was funny i also liked how there was a sense of transformation like for instance when the bricks fall on him and you see him kind of become the bricks. Yeah, that was clearly that like was becomes funny. the brick. This brick wall. This like ocean of bricks mm-hmm. are falling on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I honestly think the closest. Maybe there's some Donald Duck ones, or maybe I guess some of the Goofy shorts are pretty silly. But it, I was thinking about it the other day with um with Captain Hook in Peter Pan. Yeah, and how slapsticky that is, and how uh-huh. you know. Sp- Sweet. Yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. And that, that that gets a little bit of that energy, but you don't see it as much at Disney. That kind of slapstick. Doesn't no, you it. really don't. And uh, and I'm with you. Like Peter Pan is a very good example of that. And maybe mm-hmm. there's some stuff in some shorts, but uh, this one just cracked me up too. So you know the the black cat gives the little tiny cat this whistle. And he's just saying, anytime okay. you feel threatened by the, you know, this dog, just whistle and I will take care of it. And and it is just a series of, yeah, things just getting dropped or getting thrown in the path. And as I mentioned to you, I think my favorite shot is they just kind of pull back and the cat just keeps whistling like every other second. And just more and more crazy things just keep falling. I mean, it, yeah. it's everything from just like a potted plant. Then, you know, it ends up to an airplane. <laughs> you know, yeah. On. Well, I like when he... And everything in between. When the cast register falls on him and the kitten comes out of the drawer. <laughs> that was funny. That's funny. And also, I liked the uh, piano. Like, so there's a sense of transformation. Piano falls on the dog. And then the kitten plays the keys in his mouth. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and there's horseshoes and fire hydrants and uh, <laughs> uh there's a point where the the blacky uh cat gets uh painted white and then he gets the <laughs> the the, uh, the dog ends up getting hit with the anvil <laughs> uh, um and then, like you said, at the end, there was just, he swallowed a whistle. And so that ends up 
every time it whistles, he gets hit with something new. And <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's so ridiculous. It's that, just mayhem. Like, if, if somebody were like upset by it, I would just say like, it's, it's so over the top. Like, yeah, one of these things would, would hurt, you know? So it's, I don't know. Like you just can't, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And that's well, what and, and, and it's just saying, you know, and it never kills the dog. No, it, it never just, does. He just bounces right back, but it's yeah. still, it slows him down. And it's, mm-hmm. it's so funny. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, that one was probably one of my favorites. Yeah. The, you know, in, in this, in this particular set. Yeah. They were saying that it won some award or something as the, uh, one of the, uh, um, I don't know if it was AFI or, Something like that. The top. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, top animated films. I mean, that. Uh, but um, yeah, let's see here. Yeah. The 50 greatest cartoons. Uh, yeah. Thing. It says it's the Tech Saver directed was voted the 15th best cartoon of all time in a 1994 poll. Of a thousand animation industry professionals. Cool. Yeah. So, all right. Then next we had Deputy Droopy. <laughs> and Droopy is in charge. This is in the Old West. Uh, he's told that you're in charge and to, f- to fight out the uh, outlaws. And there's two outlaws that are trying to steal the new money that's just come in from the bank. And Droopy is guarding the safe. And it this was pretty, pretty funny. This reminded me of almost felt like something from the 90s. Yeah. In that kind of sort of Home Alone-esque type of yes. era of violence. It's, say it's very Home Alone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No question. Because <laughs> Droopy just seems almost like this helpless little dog. Yeah. It's just, just, you know, just so tiny. And then just the way he talks, you know. Um but, yeah, yeah. I was he's, laughing quite a bit. Skills, yeah, that was funny. Me too. That made me laugh a lot. Yeah, and I really liked, uh, I guess the voice of Droopy, Bill Thompson. Yes, and he was very good. I really oh, yeah. enjoyed it. I think that's what. I also think it's one of the things that really makes the Droopy character mm-hmm. is is his voice. Yeah. yeah, I mean Bill Thompson, he's a legend. Incredible. He voiced. The the White Rabbit and Mr. Smee, speaking of Peter yeah. Pan. Yeah. So and that's incredible range. And oh. yeah, it starts out with Droopy putting glass on the ground uh, for the outlaws. And uh, I thought it was really funny that he kept, they kept running back to the same spot. <laughs> they would have something happen, then they'd go, and it, it reminded me of what Chuck Jones says in the documentary, where he says that Tex would extend his jokes longer than any others. Mm-hmm. That there was sort of a normal breaking point, and then he would push it even further. And yeah. you know, it kind of reminded me when we talked about the UPA films, in particular, the. Uh, um, Mr. Magoo Christmas Carol. Yes. You know, and that like he'd crash one car and then crash another car and crash another, like it was just like extending out that kind of mayhem. Yeah. So I thought, I thought it was really funny. I, I had, I had relatively unknown to Droopy and uh, I, he won me over. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you liked it because I, I remember enjoying those Droopy cartoons as a kid, you know, because uh-huh. they're all, similar you know yeah. um but uh this one i thought was particularly yeah this representative and, and particularly funny yeah. i loved when they bottled the scream up <laughs> that was funny the pain from the scream i also <laughs> liked when he sits on the lobster and like you can just see it getting more and more and more uncomfortable <laughs> as he sits <laughs> That was funny. Yeah. And you have at the end, you have Droopy literally feeding a bottle to <laughs> the outlaws. And the outlaws are just like, I turn myself in, I give up. Yeah. That's what I love. How they turn themselves in finally. You know, yeah. they just give yeah. up. <laughs> they're just, and they're just destroyed, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then we had Screwball Squirrel 
and uh, this is there's like a regular cute squirrel, and then there's kind of the fast talking yeah and squirrel. This one just seemed to be, I mean, and I think they had mentioned some of this early on in the documentary, uh-huh. but uh, it's all this was like a total jab at the yeah. Disney style, right? Yeah, and do you know who also I think still does a lot of this is uh, Gendy. Yeah, though in those Hotel Transylvania movies and yes. some other stuff he does, you see a, a lot of this kind of feel. I think. Yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I loved when they used the William Tell Orchestra. <laughs> oh, me this. too. That was very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very funny. I also liked the gag where he gets the, he gets the guy sick, seasick, and then he get, then the squirrel himself gets seasick. <laughs> I was like, oh no, that was funny. Yeah, it also broke the for, broke the fourth fourth wall uh, before they play hide and seek, which was kind yes. of fun. And uh, uh, and she- so yeah, it was fun. And I don't know because it was a squirrel too, but it also it reminded me of, uh, and maybe again just the squirrel, but of of a uh, slappy squirrel in in uh, Animaniacs. Oh yeah, kind of that that that, oh, yeah. that kind of style. Um, did you ever watch that new Animaniacs? I did. I watched all of those. It was episodes. It good? Um, I've been a little know, nervous. Pretty good. Pretty good. Some of them, of course, you know, a little uneven. I mean, they did a lot of episodes. Uh-huh. So I had a total binge watch, like over two days. I watched all because <laughs> that's a series that I really love, you know. Yeah, I love um, all. I have all four seasons on DVD. Yeah, they're so, you know, they're so good, as you know. And they, uh, this one, they did, you know, combination of Wackly Acting and Dot stories and then Pinky in the Brain. Yeah. And, uh, oh. and not anything else. Maybe a couple other little things here and there, but overall, it was just those two. I and need to watch it. I, yeah, I think you'll it. like it. Yeah. I, you know, uh, they reunited the vocal cast, and uh, and it's 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 pretty fun. Pretty good. Um, we should yeah. mention that they had an uh, ongoing kind of partnership with HBO Max as part of the festival, and a whole bunch of stuff over there as well that people could. That watch. was a really fun thing about the turn the. TCM yeah. Classic Film Festival this year. And they can, they likened it unto having like two venues, you know, which is what they do at the regular, the regular festival in person. You know, you have to choose which one you're going to go to, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But they, so on the linear, the quote unquote linear network, you know, they just played the regular stuff. And then they had a whole additional set of programming on HBO Max, which was really uh-huh. great. The, the animation stuff played on the linear network. So, yeah. um, Right. They didn't. They didn't have the animation stuff on HBO Max, but still, and it's still there. The HBO yeah. Max stuff, as of you know, as of recording <laughs> right now. Right. I don't know. I don't know how long they're going to keep it there. But if you want to kind of taste of of what the TCM Classic Film Festival is like, yeah, check out. You should. It's on the. It's on the TCM Hub on HBO Max. Yeah. And you know what I also thought of as I was watching these was you remember when we did the night is short walk on girl. Yeah. And that was one of yeah, Miyuasa. That was one of he, what he said, Tex Avery he said was one oh. of his influences. It influences one of his yeah. characters. And it, it makes sense when you think about it the totally physical comedy sense. of that movie and the way sort of there's like a uh, extremism to that movie that yes. makes sense. That would, you know, you say, oh, yeah, that's very Tex Avery ish, mm-hmm. isn't it? Or Tex yeah. Avery like, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next one was King Size Canary. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, I liked the uh. whole joke of he's trying to get food and he sees the food in the fridge. And then when he goes to open the fridge, there's a for rent sign in the fridge. <laughs> That made me laugh. The gags were so good. Even how they, even how the cat got into the house, I thought yeah. was funny. You yeah. know, and then, and then you know this giant bulldog chases him, and he, he reaches. Where does he get those sleeping pills? I, does he just reach them? Are they in the house? Or I can't remember how he. Yeah, I think they're so, in the yeah, house. So yeah, so just something. instantly he knocks this dog out. <laughs> right. Um, which I thought was funny, but it comes back later. But um, anyway, yeah. And uh, they, uh, they, everything's starting 
small and becoming very, very big. They can, and, yeah, there's this like this. It's like miracle grow for plants kind mm-hmm. of thing. I mean, not it's not this. They called it something else, not the you know the brand name of the product, but yeah. Uh, and so yeah, they they take a swallow of this and then they turn into a giant version, you know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he he feeds this little baby canary. This cat feeds this little gets in the house, feeds the little baby canary some of that miracle grow. And he turns into this giant thing, which he's then he's super excited. He's like, oh, look at all the food I'm going to jump. Thank you. Look at all the food I'm going to get to eat. And then it just everything goes haywire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So it was, it was a fun one. And then they had the TV of tomorrow. Yeah. I wish you know, they, these last two were from the 50s and they really have a different style in them, don't they? I mean, they're, they're not, they're not these, you know, Anthropomorphic animals trying to kill each other. Um, this it kind was of all... reminded me of that when we did the UPA shorts. The uh, yes, yeah, like that too. one on the train. Mm-hmm. Remember? Yeah these these seem very uh, in line. I mean, maybe that's that's not the right word, but just very similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. just, just to to uh, to the UPA shorts, both in style and and in content. It almost felt like those shorts that they had or the commercials that they had uh, on WandaVision. Oh, yeah. You remember that? For sure. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so then there was Symphony and Slang. And <laughs> this one was pretty good. It's St. It Peter was super clever. and the Gates. It, it kind of, um, I thought it was, it kind of wore out its welcome. Yeah, but, that's uh, fair. But still incredibly clever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That he tells him, so he sends him to, because he's speaking this kind of jive talk, this jazz talk, and he sends him to Webster to try to understand his vocabulary. And, and that like everything is taken literally. That's kind of the gag. Yeah. So, like, that, cut the, the gag mustard that... is literally cutting mustard. Yeah. All of it was that. like he got this information and he fell to pieces. So literally he falls, you know, his mm-hmm. body falls in multiple pieces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he combs everywhere and he's like combing the ground or whatever, you know. So out of these shorts, would you have a favorite? Uh, yeah, it's um, uh, the, the black hat blackie. Am I saying the wrong? Bad luck blackie. Bad luck. Thank you. Yeah, that's I, that's my favorite. Yeah, that one's really good. It's either that one or Deputy Droopy. I think Deputy Droopy was solid too. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really good, and I enjoyed all of them. I guess mm-hmm. I don't want to, you know, give the impression that I didn't. Even even the uh, um, sl- slang one, even though I thought, you know, I kind of after about four minutes in, I'm like, okay, I think I'm I'm good. Even though yeah. it was it was clever from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they still they were fun, and again, I just I just felt uh, so so happy to learn more about their creation. You yeah, know? these Me these. Too. these these films that I've enjoyed my whole life, uh, you know, these short films, it was just, it was really fun to learn, mm-hmm. learn more. Yeah. And it's like this name that you hear about Tex Avery. If you're in the animation world, you know about him, yeah. of course, because I do love Looney Tunes so much. And so I knew Tex Avery, but to kind of learn more and to learn about these ones that he really were sort of his creation uh, that in that kind of, intimate way was really fun yeah agreed so that it was great i was glad that they did that and that they showcased uh animation Mm -hmm. on in the festival that was really cool uh for them to do so if any of you listening if you got to see this special the shorts or the documentary let us know what you thought and of these ones that we talked about, I'll put a list in the description of the, of the seven that we talked about. Uh, let us know what you think of them uh, because they were a lot of fun for us to watch. Yes, indeed. Yes. So, <laughs> so Stanford, where can people find you and your content? Uh, thanks on Twitter. I'm at Stanford Clark and I have a movie podcast and blog at movies past and present.com. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. 
And if you're listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. We really appreciate that. And if you are listening on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have our patron group, which we have really awesome perks for only $2 a month. You can support the Patreon and you have, have uh, parts of watch alongs that we do that are really fun. We had a Q&A with Mary Lou Henner, legendary actress. I mean, really great perks for very little money. So check that out. And then also we have the merch store. We can get hashtag animation junkie shirts and uh, you can enjoy that. So thanks so much. This was so much fun to talk about and uh, we'll talk to you all later. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye.